And we are live. Hey, I am pretty stoked to be uh, talking to Eddie Brill today. But uh, before I get into that, Shanda Sung's interview is out today. And right at the top of the interview, I let you know that she is headlining the Comedy Attic in Bloomington, Indiana on New Year's Eve. And there are still some tickets available, both for the 8 o'clock and 10.30 show. So uh, Shanda is fantastic. She is she is one of the um, few comics I've interviewed that I actually worked with. So I actually did a show with her in Indiana a couple years ago. So pretty stoked to uh, see her headlining. She uh, started comedy later in life like I did, but... Um, it, she's uh, very funny. So check out the Comedy Attic, one of the best uh, clubs in the country for comedy, in my particular opinion. And check out Shanda and check out the interview. It was a great interview. But enough of that. Let's bring out my guest today. Uh, I told Eddie that I'm going to change up my uh, my intros a little bit and just bring him up and start talking to him because I just fuck up inter intros all the time. So I'm just going to do it right. So let's bring him out right now. I'm going to put you over here. Eddie, thank all you right. so much for being on the show. It's my pleasure. And you already said the fuck. So you already let me know that. Uh, yeah. yeah my, I don't have to ask that question. You know? you know, it's funny. I'm a clean comic, but in real life, I cuss like a sailor. So there you go. <laughs> Well, you could tell you're mostly clean because instead of curse, you said cuss. Yeah, yeah. You know, like, cuss is a very <laughs> polite way. Like, yes, it I'm is. I'm going to curse, but I'm not going to curse that bad. I'm just going to cuss. Yeah, yeah. And, it's a, and, it's a little and just cuss. and just fucking deal with it, okay? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, I think I'm pretty much the same way. You know, when I was first doing stand-up, I was very clean uh, with what I did. Well, you know, when I first started having an idea of what I wanted to do, I was as clean as possible because mm -hmm. I knew that would get me a lot of work and, you know, I could get the laughs. And somebody taught me uh, a lesson early on, very early on. I was doing a Charlie Brown's teacher bit that everyone in my generation had done about one, 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 one. Uh -huh. And one of the lines in it I wrote, I had a fucking trombone for a teacher out of context, but I would say that line and uh -huh. it would get a big laugh. Uh -huh. And a really great comedian named Jimmy Tingle from Boston, still at it, still brilliant. He told me, he says, why are you saying fucking trombone? Just say, I have a trombone for a teacher. And that's really funny. You don't uh -huh. need to use fuck as an adjective. Mm -hmm. So I said, I don't know about that. He goes, no, trust me. I, I'm telling you, it's a great joke. And it wasn't a great joke, but it was, <laughs> it was a joke that was going to get laughs, you know, with that way. So I went and I said, I got a trombone for a teacher. Not the same laughs. I did it again. No laughs. So I went back to fucking trombone. Big laughs. Yeah. So I called yeah. Jimmy on the phone and I said, you know, um, I don't, I can't agree with you there. I tried it. I gave it my all. He said, you know, the problem is, is not the words. He said, it's the expression. You could say fucking without using the word by doing that with your nonverbal skills by going, I got a trombone for a teacher. Right. And right. I, and then I ended up getting the same laughs as without saying fucking because i was able to use layers as opposed to just words i was able to use expressions as well uh -huh. and it was a big early lesson to you know to realize that there there are layers to performance levels there's you know words are only one form of communication but the most important part of most stand-up comics not the only part is the nonverbal communication skills the the pausing the being comfortable in the silence, mm -hmm. all of that kind of stuff. Right. There's a joke and then there's a performance. And those are two really different things. And so you're kind of a writer, a director, and an actor all at the same time. Okay? Yeah. Yeah. You know, and, and it's I, funny because at this time of life, I'm sorry for cutting you off, but you right. mentioned that this, um, you know, there's a, a company called Word uh, Collections and you know, c companies um, are have been paying comedians to run, you know, these platforms are paying comedians to run their material, but they're only paying for the, you know, the performance and not for the words. Mm -hmm. In music, you pay, if Dolly Parton sings, writes a song for Whitney Houston, they're each getting paid for their part. Well, the comedian's supposed to get paid for both. And all <laughs> this time, we haven't gotten it. And now we're trying to, collect that money that's due that and there's laws i mean there are laws that the that have been broken 
by right. these companies who refuse to pay the comedians what is really theirs. That you know, that's a fantastic thing to happen because you know it's your 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 art, your the the things that you write is so important, and these days it's so easy to steal it. First of all, uh, yeah, that, it's it's yeah. I mean you somebody posts their set on YouTube that they did for an open mic and somebody takes a joke from that and makes it their own across country. And you don't know it until all of a sudden they're a headliner and they're using your joke. And yeah, uh, you know, on a slight kind of the same subject, but slightly different. Uh, did you hear about the Spotify thing where that's the one? Were, that's, yeah. That's okay. It. Okay. Yeah. The Spotify so, uh, thing. Spotify you know, I, has used, has used all of these comedians and, when they were called to the carpet, they pulled the comedians from, you know, from Spotify mm -hmm. because they got caught breaking the law. Yeah. So, and so I am now, so yeah. I'm so glad that you're bringing that up because I went on a, 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 a week long rant against Spotify. Not, you know, the other thing this uncovers is they don't pay their artists enough. Right. And so they are the biggest. They're making the most money. And yet they are at like um three hundredths of a cent uh per play and that's i mean it's just really it, it's ridiculous when you look at everybody else i actually canceled my spotify subscription and uh subscribed to title t-i-d-a-l which is a better it's got better uh audio quality but the big thing is, is they pay their artists three times as much as the uh, as Spotify does, and right? Someone someone said something, and I don't, I can't quote it exactly. You know, these wealthy conglomerates. The the only way someone can be that wealthy is if you're a criminal. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, yeah, and that's what happens in these situations. It's cr it's criminal. You know what they have done, and but at the you know there was a there was a company called Audium. And they, they were able to collect the money for the musicians mm -hmm. who were getting screwed. And the same people from Audium have started this Word Collections. So if you go to wordcollections.com, you could find that and join in. And, you know, and, you know, the people who have joined us are not only great comedians who are alive, but, you know, the estate of George Carlin, the estate of Richard Pryor, mm -hmm. um, on and on and on, you know, Bill Hicks. And then, you know, comics who are alive, like, you know, Margaret Cho and, and Stephen Wright. There's a long, long list. And uh -huh. so if you go to Word Connections, you'll find that. There's another company doing it as well. And they're really nice people. And they, they have comics best interest in mind. But they're, they didn't invent the, the mechanism to, to figure this out. Uh, a word uh, Collections has. Mm -hmm. So if you go to wordcollections.com, you know, you can even sign up and be one of the people. If, you, if, if you've had anything on any of the platforms there's money that that's yours that uh is going to have to go to the courts and f fight and there's no there's nothing they can do about it because it's the law right yeah <laughs> yeah 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 that's that's great and have you been like a part of that where you help them uh help them find the the broken laws or are no i'm not i'm a you know i couldn't tell you a law from you know okay it's spell lawyer that's a yeah hard word, but well, that's a good one it. yeah yeah <laughs> so w and a y next to each other but the uh, i was mostly looking out my manager's husband um uh -huh. is an, you know just all good people of course and they he was really good friends with this guy with word uh collection so that we connected and i just alerted my friends like mm -hmm. look we're getting screwed and uh and you know we don't want to cause any harm we just want to get what's coming to us right and then be, continue to have relationships with these people so um so the same people from audium are running word collections and you know they they're even doing spoken word stuff like they're representing muhammad ali's estate mm -hmm. uh you know uh, uh, dick gregory you know people have passed who's whose families rely on this money that's not coming in so mm -hmm. yeah so i mean it, it, like i said there's another company doing it as well there they have really great comedians they're really nice folks mm -hmm. where we're, we want to do the same thing for everybody but i think there's a little bit more money on the word collections because you don't have to go through another company in order to uh break down the money in that right 
Right. And it's good that comedians are actually getting some sort of uh, support and a little bit of a leg up for once. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, comedians look out for each other. I mean, yeah. there's a, a small amount of people who in any business that are you know, scumbags and that kind of a thing. And, you know, in comedy, it's there's a, there, you know, there's always a way to, you know, take advantage of people. And and if there's a way to do it, people will take advantage. I mean, it's just human nature. Like if you could save a dollar on your taxes, you're not going to go, ah, nah, you know, I'm going to be more honest. And, right. You know, yeah. you know, that, I mean, it's just <laughs> human nature is to really get the best you possibly can out of whatever you're doing. Yeah. Uh, but then there gets to a point where it's just over the top and you have to care about people, especially, you know, my material, your material, whoever, whatever comedian, that's your baby. And if uh -huh. someone steals your baby, it's, you know, and I've yeah. had that a lot. I've had comedians do my stuff on the tonight show and, other shows and you know i've had comedians sell my material to famous comedians and you know there's it's very hard there's a lot very little you can do except you know just know that you <laughs> you wrote these incredible pieces that that interested comics that you respected yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> and you know i watched a lot of uh, your your tape before the interview and you know your your stuff is universal enough that it could be made into somebody else's joke and that's hard because you know you're when you're when you're doing observations and things like that i mean it doesn't take a whole lot to put that in somebody else's persona and yeah and, but and, here's the thing here's the thing again i'm interrupting you i'm sorry um, it's like no one had my grandmother. So the story about my grandmother, right. whether yeah. they, you know, rep repeated or whatever, but like, I'll, I'll give you the example. I, you know, I wrote a bit a million years ago, uh, 1985 or four uh -huh. and maybe even earlier than that. Cause I had done comedy in college and then I quit and I was about, how can you have a word like nonchalant when there's no such word as chalant and I would do the act out and mm -hmm. I was pretty much. You know, my hero was George Carlin, so I was like, my rhythms were George Carlin. Like, you know, how can you have a word like nonchalant? But well, there's no such word, come, you know, as yeah. as chalant. It's like, Ray, be like me, nonchalant. You know, and that was oh, yeah. the, the rhythm. So I had done it on television in my first ever television appearance in 1986. And someone came up to me and said, you know, I saw you do George Carlin's joke on uh, on the star search and i go well, first of all i love george Carlin. i've never heard him do that routine they go well i saw him live and he did that joke so of course i took it out of my act and uh i didn't do it because i you know he's my hero and i definitely wrote it myself and i you know i mean the uh -huh. rhythms were george carlin but it was my joke right so years later i was at the working with robert schimmel at the uh valleys in las vegas and george carlin uh -huh. was in the big room and I saw him out on the casino floor working the, you know, the, the machines. And mm -hmm. I went up to him when he was done. And I said, hi, you know, I comedian and you're my hero. And that's why I'm doing comedy. And and uh, I wrote a joke and I just want you to know that I wrote it and I did it on television. And once I heard you did it, I took it out of my set. And he goes, well, let me tell you this. First of all, you're smart to take it out of your set because people are going to think you're a thief stealing from me. that, And you don't deserve that. Because I didn't write that joke. Someone gave me that joke and told me about it. And I loved it, and I put it in my act. Uh, and he goes, so can I shake the hand of the guy who wrote that fantastic joke? And uh, uh, so that was really sweet that that happened. And then, yeah. you know, I got to be close with him, and I knew his family. And when he died in 2008, his daughter told me, you know, you should do that joke. You should go, you should put that back in your act. Just, just honor him in, in that way. And I don't really do it very often but once in a while i'll do that but it turned out to be really nice because it, he he loved the joke enough to use it mm -hmm. in his act you know on stage and i was and so he i got to be friends with him because he realized that i was a good joke writer and and that kind of a thing or as good of a joke writer at that moment that i could have been that's great now with your friendship with with carlin what what advice did he give you or what nuggets of wisdom did he did he give you that just stuck with you for the rest of your career? Uh, a bunch of things. My favorite one is about perspective. He says, you know, when when you're talking about a subject, if you give people your perspective, they can't argue it. They might mm -hmm. not agree with it, 
But if you give your perspective, you know, that's your perspective and they can't argue Mm -hmm. uh, with it. They might not like it. It might turn them off. It might freak them out. um, But they can't argue with you. If Mm -hmm. it's truly your perspective, uh, then, you know, then that's what you should adhere to. And, uh, you know, like if different people have different perspectives, like he's, he's I and one of the best compliments I ever got was in Boise. Idaho, and I have to say Boise because they get mad if you don't pronounce the S in the hard way. And I go, we don't say New Jersey, but that's, that's a whole other thing. And and I was in Boise, and I was performing in the crowds, a lot of Mormons, and I did some religious material, which, you know, I talked to Carlin about, and he said, just do it, you know, as long as your perspective kind of thing. And these uh-huh. four Mormon women came up to me after the show, and they said, look, we didn't agree with your take on religion, but we respected the way you did it. Uh-huh. And that's one of the best compliments I've ever gotten in my life because I took these people who totally opposite of the way I think, or not totally, uh, you know, pretty much opposite of what the way I think, and di- weren't pissed at me for for right. sharing my perspective. And they were open enough to realize, look, we can't, we're not thinking alike, but at least you were classy enough to not take the easy way out and just shit on something you weren't familiar with. That, that's exactly what I was going to say. You can put that perspective forth without shitting on the people who have the different perspective. It's just, it, but it's, it is delicate. It's, yeah. it's, it, it's, it's a really fine line between uh, presenting something as your perspective. Like, you know, okay. You know, I, I, I'm a Buddhist, so I don't believe in the whole Mormon th- thing but here's here's some similarities between them and i I don't have a joke here but here's the similarities so you know we're we're not that far apart but uh you know and make it make it so it's play more playful than uh damning of somebody's religion and yeah i i get that but it is a fine line and you know i i find even in my you know, PG 13 stuff, I have found myself crossing a line and been, uh, you know, checked for it. You know, I've, I, you know, I've got a joke that, um, I thought I was doing it wrong. And I, uh, the punchline of the joke is, you know, I guess I'm my wife's gay roommate because I, you know, I talk about the, um, fact that I don't like sports and cars and stuff like that, but I like to watch say yes to the dress and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And uh, I thought that by saying that I was my wife's gay roommate, I thought that might be offensive. So I changed it to, Oh, I'm gay. And I had a gay friend tell me, Hey, that ain't right. (laughs) You just, you just took a good joke and screwed it up. And uh, what you're saying is no gay people like sports. Right. And, yeah. And that, you know, and that kind of thing. And so you're making a statement. Now, if it was your perspective and you said, you know, I grew up in this household where we didn't really understand gay marriage or we didn't, under, you know, we were Bible thumpers and mm-hmm. this is how we lived our lives. And when the, you know, and then when I realized what gay was, I mean, if it comes from a certain place right. and we understand that it's a different story, but then it becomes a lecture instead of a comedy joke. Right. And yeah. you're really just trying to get a laugh here. And, uh, it's important, but yeah, you know, I, I've learned, that, you know, vulnerability is a strength as, as opposed to what we were taught as young men, that mm-hmm. vulnerability means you're weak and that macho means you're strong. But the reality is it's the complete opposite, right? You know, mach- machismo or whatever, you know, that's a sign of insecurity. That's someone, you know, going, they're afraid to go deep down. So they use force or anger or whatever to sh- show up their insecurity and mm-hmm. some people like doing that and some people are attracted to that and you know good for them and all that stuff but the more vulnerable you are you look at the, the thread of all the greatest comedians of all time and they all had a thread of vulnerability mm-hmm. not everyone but 90 percent of them did oh yeah carlin Pryor, tomlin you know they all it, you know but the, like i saw someone on the tonight show recently I don't know if the show was recent, but I saw recently a video of someone on the Fallon show who did a set and there was no vulnerability. Everybody sucked but that but the comedian. Mm-hmm. And it's not compelling. There's nothing compelling about that. You know, you can have this bravado, but it's gotta every once in a while knock you on your ass. 
mm-hmm. uh, because that's more human and it's more compelling and it's it's richer and deeper. Now, look, there's room for people who are not compelling. There are room for people yeah. who are, you know, who go out there and everybody sucks but them. But if you look at the staying power of the greatest comedians in the world and the most revered comedians in the world, they have that vulnerability as their strength. Uh huh. And I think a good example of that would be like a Lewis Black. Okay, so in on the face of it, it's everybody's wrong but him, but he does plenty of stuff in between saying how fucked up he is. Yeah. And and and, and it's it, he he really um and it, he really strikes a balance between between saying how fucked up the world is and how, you know, he doesn't know if he should eat, eat an egg or not, you know, things like that. So it, he really makes, he really makes himself out to be a very angry, sympathetic character. And that that's hard to do. Yeah. Bill yeah. Burr is very good at that. Yeah. He's Bill Burr is very good Yeah, at, you know, really, you know, I agree with 99% of the things he says. And, and sometimes yeah. it takes me a little bit of time to understand the perspective but he's just so smart and so great at it mm-hmm. and then you know but every once in a while it'll come back and bite him in the ass and it just makes him that much more superior to me as a great stand-up comedian you know mm-hmm. you know you look at jonathan winters you know he always was these characters but it always would eventually come back and be like whoops you know whoopsie you know, <laughs> yeah <laughs> it, it was really you know and it was a different time too Another thing Carlin taught me was to understand when you have a, a, a like, say, say I want to talk about gay marriage. For uh-huh. instance. Um, I have my feeling about gay marriage that it, you know, should exist and there shouldn't be a question if love is love. And if you love somebody who who's to tell you, you can't do that or you can't love that. And it doesn't mm-hmm. make any sense any other way. Right. It's just I understand people have been, you know brainwashed into thinking that there's negativity there but that only comes from insecurity and really great marketing skills you can Mm -hmm. market your insecurity to other people and let them join that insecurity bus where they don't understand uh, gay marriage so what i did was i made a list on of all the reasons why i believe that you know gay marriage is totally okay there shouldn't be an argument it's like um that we have civil rights leaders it's like, why would we need a civil rights leader? Why isn't civil rights, you know, who, who needs a leader for civil rights? It yeah. should be just natural. Same uh-huh. thing with gay marriage. So I wrote all the reasons on one side of the page why I believe that it's ridiculous uh, that there's an argument. And then I wrote all the arguments that I've been hearing from people along the way. Uh-huh. And what I was able to do was cross-reference like I wanted to make a joke making fun of the way other people think. Like, so the joke was, look, I, I think a, a lot of people are afraid of gay people and they're, the power that they have over them, that the supposed power over them. And uh, they think that, you know, if they don't let gay people get married, they'll disappear. Mm-hmm. And I go, and then the line I stole from the other side, I go, and acting like it was my words, and I said, now, people don't realize this, but gay people have been around for 50, 60 years. So <laughs> the joke comes off of their st- stupidity or ignorance to the f- truth. Yeah. Um, it's shoving it back in their face in the sarcastic way to do that is to make them realize that this argument is, is really a waste of time and really against nature and life and, and, st- and worry. There's so many other things you could worry about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That that's really good, and yet you did it in a way that was not not in your face, saying, "Hey, you gay marriage bashers are stupid." Right. And you let them draw that conclusion themselves because it's their it's their words. I'm only yeah. repeating their words. I'm yeah. not, you know. Yeah, yeah, that's great. So thinking about, you said you had your first TV spot in 86. Is that right? I did Star Search. I've, I've done all kinds of things, but I think the first network television thing I did was in October of 86, and it aired in January of 87, I think. Okay. So let's talk about when you started and what it took to get to that particular performance. You know, you 
comics, what, what non, non comedians don't understand is what the journey is like going from that first time you got up on stage to when you're doing the TV spot or you, you get to, you get to work with Letterman for 17 years and stuff <laughs> like that. So what, what was a, you know, a brief synopsis of where did you start and how did it get you to that TV spot? Well, I started in college, and the first friends I met were, were very funny, and we formed a comedy group. Mm -hmm. It was mostly improv and sketch, and it was wildly successful, wildly successful. We, were, we couldn't believe how successful it was, and we felt mm -hmm. like rock stars. Excuse me. It was the late 70s in Boston at Emerson College, and yeah, I could name drop the list to you of all the people who were there just before us and over there during the time I was there and then after. And the, the college really turned out incredible comedians, including Dennis Leary, uh, you know, Bill Burr, uh, uh, Jen Kirkman, uh, mm -hmm. Stephen Wright, you know, and then back at Jay Leno and uh, Andrea Martin and then Jennifer Coolidge. And uh, I mean, I can go on and on and on, uh -huh. you know, Laura Keitlinger and Lauren Dombrowski and uh, just Mario Cantone and it's just it was a very good place for us to do some stuff. Stephen Wright was doing doing a little stand up and we decided to do a little stand up too just cuz they were all our friends, you know, there uh -huh. was uh, comics in Boston who were just it was incredible s small scene but it was powerful because there was a lot of really good local Barry Crimmins and Don Gavin and these people in Boston who were just these brilliant minds who were uh, also silly and really fun. And I did it a little bit and it some were good and some were awful and you know just the beginning and i liked it you know i had i had improv and sketch background now so i was able to pull it off on stage despite nervousness but then i just decided i was going to quit and do something different i don't know why mm -hmm. and uh i moved back to new york where i'm originally from and um i uh, took me a few years to a situation came up to run a comedy club in the city and i said i wasn't going to and then i said yes because i didn't really like the job that i had at the time it was a nondescript job with horrible hours and it was yeah. just about making money and there was no life yeah and i missed and all my friends were starting to do pretty well for themselves in comedy so i uh i started again in 84 in july and the one of the first people I met was Colin Quinn, and Colin helped me run the place. And we were bringing in all our friends who were comics: uh, Stephen Wright, Mario Cantone, and then New Yorkers were Judy Gold, Susie Essman, uh, Adam Sandler was going to NYU at the time. He was down the street from the club, so we started. We started a little. We had a nice little club, and just by bringing the best comics in the world into that place we were starting to bring in you know people who were kind of stars at that time to come in and they weren't big stars yet but they were as good as like brett butler and john stewart and you know like i said adam sandler and people like that would come in and uh it just forces you to get better and better at what you do mm -hmm. um I wasn't a great comedian. I was a good performer, and I performed the hell out of my really mediocre material. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, and that got me Star Search. Now, I didn't win at Star Search. My friend Sue Kalinsky uh, was much sharper than I was and pulled it off in a way that was, you know, she deserved to win that thing. But it got me out to L.A. So mm -hmm. I decided, you know, because I'm a workaholic, I decided I was going to just go on star search and lose and leave. I was going to go to the big clubs and try to get on. So mm -hmm. I went to the improv and they loved me. And they said, we, if you move here, we'll get you on all the time. I went to the comedy store. They said, look, you were great. And we want to make you a regular and you don't have to live here. Whenever you come here, you go on. And that, so that turned out, I started working at the comedy store mm -hmm. and I, Mitzi Shore, who ran the comedy store, Polly Shore's mother, mm -hmm. um, put me up at the house behind the comedy club because you know, I didn't have a place to live. And I, the comedy store was my living room. So mm -hmm. every night without fail, I was at the comedy store, either going on or watching somebody else, but I was mm -hmm. always around. And my roommate behind the thing was one of the guys who was in charge of the box office. So if one of the comics didn't show up or was late, he'd call me, get over here. I'm going to put you on. Mm -hmm. So I, uh, you know, I would average like 15 to 20 spots a week and wow. 
work with Kinnison and, you know, all the great, Roseanne Barr and all the great comics at the time, uh, who, Richard Pryor, all these people coming in. So I had a classroom as my living room. Mm-hmm. And, and a lot of these comics took their time, especially Kinnison and Robert Schimmel and, uh, you know, all these other comics. They would, John Mendoza, I can long list. And they took the time to help me uh, by just, you know, telling me what I was doing was right, uh, offering ideas like that. So it really took years and years. So I started, say, in, in college in like 76, 77. And here I am. It's 1987. I'm in L.A. And 10 years later, and I'm not, you know, I'm, I did Star Search. That was pretty much it. Mm-hmm. And it, that was, you know, I was thankful, but it, I didn't have this career. I ended up having a career because I was at the comedy store every night. And like anything, you have to be there. All You have to love it. You have to marry it. Mm-hmm. You have to you have to love it. You have to nurture it. You, you know, David Brenner told me those things that you got to be married to it and you got to nurture it and you got to love it and you got to uh, and also uh you know take chances and and have fun and it's, you know i was so you really learn there's so many great comedians who spend their lives helping other great comedians or young comedians i'm sorry uh great comics helping young comics and uh mm-hmm. you know and i think that's so important and i i'll never forget you know every day how thankful i am to have these people so your original question was to try to show people it doesn't it doesn't happen overnight Mm -hmm. uh you can have you know it's better to have the experience of doing comedy in different scenarios than just be successful at one thing early and then fade out Mm -hmm. i went i went to england in 1989 uh and that changed my whole life because, first of all, the comedy scene was tighter, a smaller place, London, uh-huh. and there was no pandering. And I didn't realize <laughs> until I went to Europe how much American comics, including myself, pandered. You know, we got applause yeah. off the backs of things that we didn't do. Right. Like, you, yeah. give yourselves a round of applause for coming out tonight. Well, yeah. think about that. <laughs> You know, why would you applaud going out tonight? I've yeah. gone out before. I don't need to applaud myself. Hey, let's hear it for the troops. Well, mm. fuck you. Why are you <laughs> using the troops to get an applause break? You're not the troops. Right. You know, they work, you know, they put their life on the line and you're using their glory to get an applause break at a comedy club when you should be not looking for an applause break, but trying to get a laugh. Yeah. With a yeah. very clever joke that you've written. Right. So England really made a difference. And then England... My friends in England now, the new friends I had, because I would go in there all the time, they turned me on to Ireland, which is a storytelling country. And mm-hmm. it's amazing how great it is to do comedy in Ireland. And then they turned me on to Amsterdam and Paris, and then they connected me with Hong Kong. And now I'm working all these different countries, Bangladesh, where English is their second language. And it just forced me to keep taking things to a new level. And I still hadn't been at Letterman yet before I had done all these other things. Mm -hmm. And luckily I, you know, I got warm up gigs in LA just to pay the bills. Mm -hmm. I worked, I did, uh, saved by the bell was my first warm up gig that I got. Oh, okay. Uh, I I warmed up the Dana Carvey show in New York, which was brilliant, too Mm -hmm. smart for American television. And then, uh, uh, Louis CK was one of the, uh, the head producers, writers over at, um, uh, the Dana Carvey show, and he was now working at Letterman, and Letterman was looking for a new warm-up comic, and Louis recommended me, and that's how I got the job. That's 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 so cool. Now, in, in watching in watching your tape, you mentioned being nervous at one point, but in watching your tape, you f- look like the most comfortable person on stage of just m- most comedians that I watch. It just seems like you don't have any anxiety over performing at all is that some is that something that you've worked towards to get to that uh, happy happy place where you're not so nervous before you go up that you screw everything up or how did you get there for me it was stage time you, you mm-hmm. that's the only real teacher you know I, mm-hmm. I run workshops all over the world helping comics being each other's eyes and ears mm-hmm. and it's really very productive but i would never say i'm teaching stand-up comedy because mm-hmm. you can't teach stand-up comedy right. you can't get it in the book 
there's one person who has a book about stand-up comedy and here's the a put a in slot b and get c and all this kind of stuff and that's fine mm -hmm. but now you're mm -hmm. gonna have ten thousand comics doing slot a slot b turns into slot c yeah. really as a comedian you just have to have stage time the more stage time you know there's there's a great quote that uh from michelangelo and they asked him how did you make the statue of david that perfect statue out of that block of marble and he said i just chipped away at the pieces that weren't him mm -hmm. <laughs> which is amazing yeah so as comics the best comics not all comics because there are comics who are characters and comics who are very successful at doing different other things but the comics that i love and the ones that i want to watch the ones i want the one i want to be is someone who chips away at the pieces that are not me and finds their most uh, vulnerable self and the interesting thing is is i love doing comedy i mean mm -hmm. i love it so get me on stage that's why i don't appear anxious or whatever because i am loving it mm -hmm. you know i can't wait to do the next one and the mm -hmm. next one and you know and even if it's shitty i, I look a, a shitty gig or i follow someone who kills the room in a bad way before you go on i look at that challenge like how am i going to get them back how am i going to do this how am i going to make this work and of course, there's all the anxiety. Oh, fuck. You know, what if I can't get these people back? What if the person before me crushed the audience in a way that this just turned them off to comedy and they're not going to respect me? And, you know, I mean, there's yeah. a million, there's anxieties galore, or else I wouldn't be a comedian, I don't think. But I think that I love it so much that, and I'm just telling stories. I learned from the masters just tell stories, mm -hmm. have a conversation with the audience. Mm -hmm. And you, one of the things I like about you and it, the fact that you're in Europe and, and all that really comes through because storytelling types of comedy in England and like you said, Ireland and Scotland and Australia is the same way um, for storytellers is um, the audiences are more patient in Europe. Uh, they they don't need a punch every 10 seconds. Uh, they, right. they don't need that laugh every 10 seconds. But then you Americanize it to the point where you do have enough tags in your in your uh, act that it does keep them leaning in and chuckling. So you were able to meld the, the short attention, attention span of Americans and uh, still be able to bring that storytelling that is done so well in Europe. So that's, that's really cool. Yeah. It's interesting. Like the, one of the best clubs in the world, the best club in the world was in Paris. It's no longer there. Mm. It's run by an incredible guy too. Um, and it was amazing because the Paris one, just every part of it was amazing because the people who ran it were really cared about comedy and the crowds were dying for English speaking entertainment. Mm -hmm. Uh, it was really great, but you know, places where, uh, the, in, in, uh, in, I'll give you one in Dublin, the upstairs at the international bar, mm -hmm. it's a very popular bar, the international bar and upstairs they have this little room that seats about 50 people comfortably and a little bar and comics from all over the world perform there and mm -hmm. you know new comics and comics have been doing forever and there's no mic there's just a little stage and it's like a puppet theater stage and it looks like and then they put people they squeeze a hundred people in there mm -hmm. and so there's people sitting on the stage there's people just packed in there and if you bullshit them they will turn off in one second and you're done yeah. but if so i learned that from working this crowd and uh, i just I didn't, I ended up doing very little material because I ended up just having a chat with them and talking about comedy. And then it just was magical because it was, there was, it was like a symphony with me and them and we're playing, we're you know, going back and forth with each other uh -huh. and melding in a certain way that, you know, I, that I won't forget the certain shows and the people in those audiences, they will never forget me. They might not remember my name, they might not remember how I, what I look like, but they'll uh -huh. go, yeah, that, and if they see me again, they go, there's that guy that one night we had a connection and it was real and it was funny and it was fun. Uh -huh. And the beer was delicious. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the, the, the beer is the most important part for me. So yeah, yeah, that's, <laughs> that's, yeah. that's, that's good. I, um, so I've talked to a couple people that, uh, 
made a career out of uh, the audience warm up uh, gig. Can you tell me, because doing it for Saved by the Bell and then doing it for Letterman, how how is the audience warm up gig different than just like headlining a club? Yeah, because you're the um, liaison to the audience. You're the mm -hmm. one that keeps them involved in what's going on, especially when you're doing sitcoms. Like I did Madigan Men. It was Gabriel Byrne's brilliant sitcom. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you what you're doing is you're the person in the audience with the who's the audience's friend who, when they're taking a break, you chat with them, you're their buddy, and you're, you know, it's a, it's a really kind of a an interesting, because it's a long night. It could be eight hours, 12 hours. And mm -hmm. you're just chatting with these people and you get to know them really well and they get to know you and, and, you know, you have to fill them in like, okay, if you remember um, the last scene before we took the break, this happened, this happened, this happened. So you're a little liaison, you're their fun buddy, you know, mm -hmm. and that's your, and, and the, but for the Letterman show it was different. It was an 18 minute pre-show where it was five minutes of video, five minutes of the band, five minutes of me and three minutes of Dave. Mm -hmm. And the, it was, uh, to the it, it was down to the science it was it was science that worked that the johnny carson's producers had created they passed mm -hmm. it along to dave and he passed it along to his staff and i don't know how that happened or what went down back back in the day but it wasn't a long uh thing and i didn't perform in between the commercial breaks that was for paul schaefer and the cbs orchestra mm -hmm. and they were one of the greatest bands in the world so the audience is thoroughly entertained and kept up in a, in a hyper mood. So my job mainly at the beginning was to take a crowd that wasn't cohesive and then bring them together. Uh -huh. And also to be able to tell Dave what the audience was like, because you learn, you learn, you can, you, you, instincts come into play. And I could tell that they were mostly tired from out of town. They were all mostly from out of town. They were very rarely were there New Yorkers in the crowd. A lot uh -huh. of, a lot of times there were complaints from, you know, people who didn't know what they were complaining about saying, well, of course, the Letterman audience is this. They're all New Yorkers in New York. They think this way. Mm -hmm. Well, 98 percent of the audiences were either from other states or other countries. And some mm -hmm. a lot of people, it was like, you know, you're on the New York City ride and here's an e-ticket to get you the <laughs> Letterman show because that was one of the things you were going to do that day. Yeah. So not everyone even knew what the show was about there. We come from Sweden and we've, you know, we never really seen American television and we're going to go to this TV show that everyone says to go to. So your job is to bring all these different people together and then let Dave know. My job was to let Dave know uh, if they were, you know, what they were like. So it made it easier for him when he came out. Yeah, that's cool. So you got to do the uh, talent coordinator job for, for that. And, and, Correct me if I'm wrong. Is that were you looking for comedians specifically to uh, perform on the show? Yeah, that was my job to find okay. stand ups. You know, um, I mean, there were stand ups who, that were great that just didn't want to do stand up on the show. They just wanted to sit next to Dave, what's called panel. They uh -huh. want to do panel because they right. feel like they're sitting with Dave. And even though they're doing their act, they're doing it in a conversation with Dave. Right. And, and to, so I was trying to find the comics that Dave liked, the kind of style of quirkiness. You know, I mean, there were amazing comedians that didn't get on the show. There were thousands of comedians that didn't get on the show who yeah. could have easily done the show and been great at it. You know, you you end up, you know, taking 0001%, percent of the people who are auditioning and uh -huh. putting them on TV. And then every year you got to, you, there's other people you got to repeat and put them back on. You're, you know, his guy, he loved Gaffigan. So every year you get Jim Gaffigan, you know, another Indiana boy, you know, yeah. the two of them. <laughs> yeah, there was no way there was a year was going to go by without Gaffigan being on the show because not only was he funny, but he was right up Dave's alley. Yeah. So, you know, it wasn't an easy job and it was a lot of work. It's a lot uh -huh. of work, but I loved it. I loved the fact that I was able to help comics because part of my job was not only just putting people on television but also being there for people who wanted to know what we're talking about now people want to know information about what mm -hmm. it takes to be on the show and what it, and i never you know never cut anybody short i gave everybody my time my email address at times my phone number to say look you know you might not have been right for the show but you know you should try to do this show because it's great or 
you know, you need to focus on this and or, you know, but never like telling them what they had to do or how to do it. It was just a conversation where we, you know, a fellow comic who had done the Letterman show and also booked the Letterman show and had worked with Letterman was able to give them straight uh, from the horse's mouth, mm, you know, yeah. right, right to them, <laughs> as opposed to comics who, because so many comics had said, you know, I when when they were talking about being booked on the show, you had to be this, or you couldn't be a character, or you couldn't do this. And I'm like, you know, who are you listening to? Yeah, are you listening to them or me? I'm the one who books them. Yeah, you know? yeah. and I have to get it approved by the producers and Dave and the and standards and practices and the you know, but you know, it wasn't as easy as it appears. And uh, it actually, I it it. it was great from my life and my career and my what I was doing, but it wasn't great for me as a comic because I was focusing more on other people's comedy as opposed to my own. Mm -hmm. and, and I took a little bit of a shot, but I wouldn't, you know, like I, if I had the chance to re go do it all over again, you know, I might think twice because it, I couldn't go to England for a month. I couldn't go to Australia, which I loved, you know, by the time you fly there, you have to fly home, you know, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, so I think I would have, have, you know, looking back, I don't regret what happened. I just wish I would have, you know, like every night I was out at clubs, looking at comics, working with comics, getting comics ready, uh -huh. um, you know, to young comics calling me up and asking me, you know, advice or mentorship or this kind of thing. But I enjoyed it. You know, I, uh -huh. I, I, I've always loved being a caretaker in some form or another. It's been the story of my life since I'm a little boy yeah. and it will always be the story of my life. That, you know, I really recognize that in you because that's, that's kind of me. And that's so funny. I've been, I've been with my wife for 38 years now and, um, she is not the caretaker. She's like, okay, if you're sick or something's wrong with you, just stay away from me. And, <laughs> and on the other, on the other side, it's, it's, uh, if anybody is the least bit uncomfortable, I'm always trying to make them comfortable. So right. I, I, and I, you, you recognize that in people. People. And it's, it's, I, I don't know if it's an empathetic thing or if it's just a nat natural thing that you do, but that's, uh, I did recognize that in you. So how did, uh, you know, how did comics get on your radar to be on the show? I, I know that people, people were, that was their goal. Okay. This is what I'm doing. I'm trying to get on the show, but did you have comics that maybe got on your radar, um, through different channels that you said you were perfect for the show? Many different ways. The best way was other comics who recommended comics to me. Mm -hmm. You know, that was the best way. Of course I had to see them and decide mm -hmm. whatever, but you know, when, when comics who had done the show, who knew the idea, you know, because a lot of people said, well, you know, I'm great and I'm not on the show. Yes, you're great. In fact, you're probably greater than this person who's on the show this week. But this person fills the, you know, kind of uh, quirky style that Dave likes and you're not that kind of comic. Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, yeah, it, you know, it's it. What happened was mostly, like I said, other comics. Um, would uh, would recommend them, but every club I went to, and I was working stand up full time at during that whole era. So mm -hmm. we worked Monday through Thursday at Letterman, and I have I go Friday and Saturday to Indianapolis, or Friday and Saturday to San Francisco, or if we had a week off, I do a a ten day jag in this other cities or whatever. Um, so I would ask the club on the Sunday to fill up a, a lineup give me 10 of your best locals mm -hmm. and there were comic comedy clubs i trusted you know um the people the people who ran the comedy clubs in minneapolis and in uh denver and in you know and in austin and you know boston and you know there's certain cities where i knew the people running the clubs and they really cared about the comedy the comedians and the scene and mm -hmm. i'd go to those people because they were smart and and I could see that they've turned their community into an incredible place for comedy. And so I'd have them pick 10 or 12 of their locals and I'd have them put them on and I'd see them live. Mm -hmm. And I'd take notes and I'd meet with all the comedians after the show if they wanted. And mm -hmm. uh, because that's what I wanted. I, want, I didn't want to, I would audition for Letterman or other shows and didn't get it. And I didn't know why I didn't get it. 
And um, so I wanted to be the person I wanted. I wanted to be the booker that I wanted to, Mm -hmm. who would come up and say, look, Eddie, look, you're not right for this. This is not the show for you. Or the show is right for you, but you need to do this. This joke doesn't work, whatever. So I try to be that. And I realized that was a mistake in a way because people didn't really want to hear that. They wanted to hear you got the show. Yeah. So if I didn't say you got the show, they didn't care if I was giving them, you know, helping them with, um, I never said this is what you had to do or how, how to do it, but they, they, they didn't want to hear anything, but you got the show. Huh. And, uh, you know, it's sometimes people are like, yeah, he's, who, who does he think he is? Or that kind of thing. It's like, well, I'm the booker who, who's a comedian who cares about comedians. That's who yeah. I am. And I'm offering you something that you probably wouldn't get because most people would just leave after the show and you wouldn't know why you didn't get the show. Uh-huh. So. Now I've heard from other comics that have done Letterman or Carson that they're every time they thought that their five minutes was a hundred percent ready, it was never a hundred percent ready. You, you, I don't you, know about that. You always had to massage it a little bit. Not always, you know, like, like Larry Miller, one of the greatest comics of all mm, time. Yeah. Him and I would work on his set and we'd go back and forth and we were friends and we respected each other's ideas of comedy and, uh, we'd massage the set together because he, you know, he, we loved the process and we uh-huh. made the set tighter and better and sharper and it was great. But, you know, no, very rarely did, um, we keep, you know, we worked on it a little bit. I would say like, okay, here's a joke and Letterman doesn't want to hear political stuff or he doesn't want to hear a Nazi joke or he doesn't mm-hmm. want to, I don't know. I'm making this up examples. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and if someone did one, I'd say, you know what, Letterman, that's not the joke he'd want in the set, mm-hmm. you know? Uh, so let's pick the other four, let's pick four and a half minutes that, that you love and that, uh, he will love. Mm-hmm. And that's, and that's how we did it. But, you know, there was a, a guy from San Francisco who wanted to do the show and he was, uh, had a, uh, he was dying of cancer. And, uh, so he made a whole thing on the internet about, you know, dying to do Letterman or something like that, some kind uh-huh. of show like that. And he, I was telling them he never auditioned for me. He didn't send me anything for me to see if he would spend the time working on the set instead of working on the website yeah. and keeping up with it. And then they deleted that. And then I met, I met him and talked to him and said, Hey, um, let's work on a set. You know, I'm coming to San Francisco. Um, you know, come open for me. We'll do a week together. We'll go over material. We'll see if we can get something for you because, you know, I mean, I wish it could help everyone who has cancer or everyone who has a, right. a thing, but you, there's not enough days in, in, in five years to help everyone who, you know, has some kind of ailment or something or a make a wish foundation or something like that. So mm-hmm. we worked on stuff and, um, uh, and so he was making a film about it and, you know, we got him on the show and it, he did a nice job. Uh, but when the film came out, it was edited in a way where he lied. He lied uh-huh. that I said this and I, he lied that I said that. And I, and I said, you know, I worked really hard to, rock your world and you worked hard too and but why did you have to make that up he says it was better i'm really sorry that i did that but i was doing it for the dramatic it was much more interesting dramatically if i mm-hmm. fumfered the, the truth a little bit and it's kind of hard to forget that that happened you know you yeah. you go above and beyond to help someone get their dream and they bite you in the ass <laughs> for doing it you know what i mean wow. so it, it things like that happen, you know, you know, occasionally, but those are very rare. Those, those are very rare. Most of the time, it's people who really are passionate about doing what they do. They're not are out to please people. They're out to do what they love. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, and and most of those people got on television. And a lot of people who deserve to get on the TV show didn't get on it yet because, you know, when you have three, 4,000 people and you only have uh, 12 spots uh-huh. or 15, you literally can't fit them all into those days. Right. Right. You know, 
Who did you uh, have on that uh, either uh, surprised you by not going any further than doing that one spot or just becoming a superstar? Well, you know, in a way, I don't really like to talk about people, you know, and mm -hmm. put their their name out there, um, you know, um, even though I, you know, talked about this guy who kind of messed things up. I, yeah. I think that, you know, a lot of people, you know, the, when the when I was booking Letterman, it started in 2001, and it lasted to 2012. Mm -hmm. And during that time, you know, it wasn't like the old days with Johnny Carson, where he was the only show that everyone was watching. At yeah. the time, you could watch, you know, uh, Conan, or I don't think, no, Conan was later. You watch Leno, you can watch Jon Stewart, you can watch a million shows that were mm -hmm. on at the exact same time. And so it wasn't like the old days where you'd, letterman and then boom you'd be a big star the next day that mm. happened but it happened very rarely because mm. of the of cable and people less and less people watching late night television especially since you can record everything and you you know you could watch mm. it later yeah uh, kind yeah. of stuff so i think that there was there were a few comedians you know i mean very i don't remember anyone really doing poorly I remember people would forget a joke or people would uh, be nervous and screw up a line or whatever. But mostly people did really well. And a couple of people who I thought would be really, really famous and weren't famous, kind of shocked. Mm -hmm. But, you know, famous is a whole different hour conversation. Yeah, you it know, is. Being yeah. famous, and, you know, there are many people who aren't famous who are incredibly talented. Yeah. You know, people. It's a that, different skill set. Yeah. Yeah. But you can you can make yourself famous and you don't have to have the, the chops to go along with it, but you can be uh -huh. really famous and that's good for them. I don't root yeah. against that, those people. So you've got to see how comedy has, uh, it, it changed quite a bit from Carson to Letterman. And uh, comedy, didn't, comedy didn't change. It was the, the, the way the audiences could see comedy. Yeah, there you go. There you go. Yeah. Um, so, and then we have today, what, what are you seeing today that, um, is making you happy about the comedy scene and what do you wish, uh, would go back to the old, old ways? It's, it's hard to say. I mean, I'm not, you know, I like to see anything that's new and up and coming and changing mm -hmm. and, and, but I always like to go back to the beginning. What's funny. And, you know, it does, it's just you know, comedy will always be, you know, a gift that you can you can give to people and give to yourself. Uh -huh. And I never want to see that change to be something that's used as a as a weapon or comedy to be used uh, to disrespect it. Mm -hmm. You know, that's the stuff I don't want to see. Um, you know, the pandemic, you know, took me out of, you know, comedy for a long time. Mm -hmm. I, remember, I think I went 149 days in between shows and. I don't know how many. I mean, that was pretty crazy, yeah. and I love it. So, I love it so much. I mean, I, we're talking about it now for over an hour, and I just left a conversation and had lunch with a friend of mine. We we're talking about comedy for a half hour, and you know, it's just, it's, I, you know, I, I love, I love comedy. I love the, I love live stand-up comedy with a live audience. Um, I love an intimate crowd. I love a big theater. Mm -hmm. Different ways to work both of those kind of venues and. But the bottom line, it comes down to, you know, the art of comedy and mm -hmm. to, you know, give it the respect and the love that it deserves and it'll give it to you. It'll give it right back to you. Yeah, that, that, that's great. You. Um, oh, I'm losing I'm losing my thought. It's, it's been okay. a big day. It's been a big day. Um, <laughs> There's a few so times in the middle of our conversation where I was like brain get me back to where we need to get yeah, to yeah 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 uh, it's uh, it's the the gray hair the, 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 the gray hair does it yeah oh, it does. um oh i was gonna i was gonna ask you um i i know you had to have been there when emo phillips was 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 on uh dave's show is he not just the the coolest guy in the world he's a genius <laughs> you know i i i fought to get him back on tv it had been 17 years since he was on the show. Uh -huh. I was like, "Oh my God, why isn't he on the show?" And I put him on, and you know, He's... I I was I was lucky enough to to know him years before I worked uh -huh. with him, and uh, 
he's just a brilliant man. He's a brilliant, yeah. brilliant human being and a great writer and a great comedian and very caring and very loving. And uh, yeah, I was able to work with him and I, I still, I saw him two and a half years ago, maybe, because I, I always think every one and a half years, we didn't have any comedy. And then the, the year before I was at the Boston Comedy Festival and uh -huh. he was there. And it was just so good. I mean, it was, it's great to see these people, you know, I mean, Dana Gould was there and mm -hmm. Tony V and all these old friends I hadn't seen in ages were at this Boston Comedy Festival and it was just good. And Emo was one of them and it just was like, he's so funny. I remember one time, you know, he was with uh, Judy Tenuta and she, I, I got hired to uh, open the show before her Showtime special to uh -huh. get the crowd going, you know, do 20, 30 minutes and, uh -huh. And so when I got there, he was so excited. He met me at the door and he goes, follow me, follow me. And he turns around and starts walking. And I noticed he has this big fuzzball on the back of his jacket, like, he, you know. And I said, uh, I said, hey, Emo, you got a fuzzball on the back of your jacket. He goes, I know, I know. Uh, follow me, follow me. It's like, <laughs> you know, you know. I don't think he knew. I just thought he was, he's just, that's his mind working. Uh. And he's, <laughs> you know, he's, he, you know. It's like he's one of the, there's a lot of genius people out there whose mind work different than most of the rest of us. And uh -huh. he really is. I, I just think the world of him. You know? Well, he's, he's such a sweetheart. So I, I did kind of a, a short Twitter campaign to try to get him to do an interview with me. And mm -hmm. he had, um, he had had a bad experience on a podcast and he took the time to send me a message that he was uh, very honored that I would want to have him on the podcast, but the the podcasts are just such a negative thing for him because of that bad experience that he just can't do a podcast. And yeah. then he said, "I he said I hope you don't hate me and all that kind of." Stuff. And mm -hmm. we we went back and forth a little bit. I said, "I could never hate you. You're 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 one of my favorites." And right. And he he's like, "Oh, I'm so glad." He says, "I'm I'm sorry." He says, "Maybe maybe someday I'll feel like doing a podcast again." But no, I just can't do it. But he, it was so nice that he took the time just to say, you know, I, I know you're, you're going through all this effort, but I just can't do it. And right. uh, well, at least yeah. he didn't just blow you off. Yeah. Yeah. That was really cool. Um, so one of the things I like to ask everybody is, um, what, uh, what do you know about stand up comedy now that you wish you would have known when you first started? Um, you know, there's a line that I've been using a lot lately based on some podcast I did in Finland. I wasn't in Finland. I was here and uh -huh. I, was, I was over there. And the name of the podcast was We're Not Here to Please You. Uh -huh. And, I, and I, I, I follow that credo now. I'm not here to please you kind of thing. And it's not harsh because I do want audience to be pleased. Mm -hmm. I want them to have the time of their lives. I want them to laugh forget about things, open up their mind, maybe think about things, but it's not for everybody. You, not every comedian is for everybody. Mm -hmm. Not everyone loves George Carlin. Not everyone loves the Beatles. You know, mm -hmm. what, what can you do? And uh, so I do what I, I've learned to do what I love. And I find that more alluring when I watch the great comedians, they're not looking to, they're not Bill Hicks, told me he said you know when we hang out together you're smart and you're fun and when you go on stage you do this love me love me dance and you know why you know it was kind of like it really knocked me for a loop uh -huh. and I was like yeah I, I guess he what he's saying is stop kissing the audience's ass uh -huh. and trying to get laughs you know as as you know uh currency uh based on you know shallow surface material when you can go deeper and talk about real things in life and how you feel, what makes you laugh, what pisses you off, what do you find ironic? And uh, so it's always more alluring, like when you want to date someone or you watch someone in a movie and when they're confident and they're acting like they don't need you, that's mm -hmm. usually much more alluring. It's more like, oh, now I really want that. Like mm -hmm. I learned that when I started auditioning for stuff, I would be like, I'm going to go in there like, look, I don't need you guys. And, you mm -hmm. know, you, if you like what I do, great. If not, someone else will. Mm -hmm. And I'd get more, I'd pass more auditions that way 
because it was much more alluring than love me, love me, desperate, desperate. Yeah. I took yeah. a lot of my jokes that used to have question marks at the beginning and would get rid of them. Instead of going, why does this happen? I go, I've often wondered. So I come from a position of knowing as, as opposed to a position of needing the audience's help, needing the audience to love me, needing them mm -hmm. to be my friend. Mm -hmm. I, I just needed them to accept me for who I am and how I think. Yeah. So I, that's the things that I've learned in the last five to six years, um, really learned and became stronger from it by not, you know, going, hey, how many people out there are married? You know, yeah. unless I wanted to spend a half hour with the audience and talk to different audience members or 10, 12 minutes and say, so tell me about your marriage. Instead, mm -hmm. I've gone, you know, a lot of people say that marriage is, you know, is tough. I think about it and here's my opinion. Mm -hmm. But I'm not out there going, you know, please ha answer this question so that I can feel comfortable with you guys. And, you know, it's it, there's a, a sense of desperation in comedy that's not alluring. Mm -hmm. And I find that the thing I learned later on is like someone said to me, you know, I didn't like what Dave Chappelle said. I go, he's not here to please you. Yeah. He tells his truth. He gives his perspective. And you might be grossed out by it. You might not like it. You might love it and not like a little bit of it, whatever. You know, that's fine. You yeah. can have all those. Good luck. You know, take them with you. And But he's not here to please you. He's here to, to share his truths. Right. And and the nice thing is there's enough comedians now. There is a comedian for you if he doesn't please you. So right. yeah. just go out and find them. <laughs> yeah. And there are a lot of comedians who will go to please the audience. And audiences want that. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. there's a lot of people who just want safe surface, you know, stuff because they can't, they can't handle the truth. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they don't well, want to. Yeah. And you know what? There's different moods too. Sometimes I really want to go see a comedian that is very thought provoking and is going to try to, um, change my mind on something and sometimes i just want to see somebody like break an egg on their face you know <laughs> yeah. you, you just you just you just want to see a prat fall or something like that just because you just want to have a totally surface laugh experience and, and yeah the three yeah, stooges and, you know yeah. the, you just want to laugh and you want to you know i saw i saw a laurel and hardy thing the other day it made me laugh and then i watched the show of shows and that made me laugh and yeah they're all different kinds of comedy and and uh, yeah, and I don't tend to to only like I whatever makes me laugh is funny. And uh -huh. I say that to people, they go, well, you know, this comic, uh, I don't find funny. I go, but some people do. And to those people, that comedian's funny. Mm -hmm. So, yep. you know, if you don't like that comedian next. Yeah. Yeah. Know, that, it's, go to somebody it's, else. It's a really easy. You know, I come out for a night of laughter and I don't want I want to forget all my problems and all this kind of stuff. Well, then don't go watch Chappelle or don't watch, yeah. you know, uh, a, co a comic who's going to provoke your, your thinking. Right, right. Yeah, for sure. Uh, so if somebody, you talked a little bit about uh, the comedy coaching. So if you were to work with an inv individual or group of people, can, and I'm keeping you a little long, is that okay? Yeah, it's okay. Okay, I, I I'll, I'll wrap it up pretty quick here. But if somebody, if you were, if you're working with people, what type of things do you try to bring out to get them to the funny faster? I try to get them to break, get rid of the things that are not them. Okay, to be their most, you know, their most authentic self. Mm -hmm. People say, well, you know, I'm look fine, trying to find my voice. You know, that's one of the lines that everyone says. I'm trying to find my voice. Well, you've always had that voice, Dorothy. You know, uh -huh. you just have to click your heels and you, you know, yeah. it's, it really is. Everyone has that voice and, and that voice is them. Uh -huh. The hard part is finding that voice and, and, and have, being brave enough to find that voice. Uh -huh. Because it's not something that's going to, you're going to, it's, you're going to open a curtain and there's going to be your voice. It's, it's there. It's deep yeah. down within. And it's how much you fear using your voice. Cause you know, yeah. advertising, religion, politics, parents, um, they spend a lot of your life shitting on your beliefs and your ideas and, and you, and, and I had great parents and I had some great, uh, and you know, decent, uh, religious experiences, but I watched the advertising. It was kind of interesting. I watched the, the history of Sesame street. They uh -huh. on TV right now. It's really brilliant. And what was happening was, is all the kids shows at that era 
or using commercial technique, commercial tools, you know, advertising uh, executive techniques to get so to sell stuff to children. So every cartoon and every not every but most cartoons and most, you know, they were saying how children, you know, three to five years old were walking around singing beer commercial ads because that's mm -hmm. that's how commercials work on television. They're they're you can't blame them. They're trying to sell shit and they mm -hmm. don't know how to sell shit that's good by just saying it's good. They have to lure you in with a with a fun song or a, a beautiful actor or actress and yeah. Um, so they were now taking that same theory and teaching kids the alphabet. So now the mm -hmm. kids were singing the alphabet, singing numbers, and they were learning just so they decided to do good things and send love instead of fear and anxiety and sell, sell, sell. Mm -hmm. You know, it this isn't this spot. You know, the other night I was watching the Rangers hockey game and there was a period, the third period was supposed to be commercial free. Mm -hmm. I was like, really? I guess, you know. So it said, this this uh, third period is commercial free, brought to you by Jägermeister. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm not making that up. That's And they didn't say it was brought to you. They had a logo in the corner. This commercial uh -huh. free is brought to you by Jägermeister. Wow. And it just, so I don't remember the exact first question you said, but the point is, is that it's important to send positive thoughts along to help a society get better and better. And we could sell passion and compassion uh -huh. if we decided to do that. But the people in charge are not going to make enough as much money if you if you use fear and hate. Uh -huh. And uh, and uh, and fear really does does really drive uh, a, 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 is a very uh, powerful tool. Yeah, and uh, and comedy, on the other hand, I think in most cases, uh, takes the tarpaulin off of that fear and lets everyone go. Hey, wait a second, you know, there's love out here. There's happiness yeah. out here. There's, you know, there's bullshit too. But uh -huh. you know, we can talk about it. Get yeah. rid of it. It's all it's all on what you look for. Yeah, if, yeah. I, I'll give you an example. Just talk about politics, whether you're a Democrat or Republican or you know, independent or uh, libertarian, there's tonight there's going to be a million kids going to sleep without food. Mm -hmm. Right? Okay. So what what should happen by tomorrow? We should get a million kids food. Mm -hmm. That's what politicians should do. Yeah. You know, yeah. not try to beat each other or outfox yeah. each other. And it's funny, outfox. It's funny. <laughs> I didn't even think of that. But they shouldn't try to out maneuver each other to 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 win a vote or to make more money um the, the the fact is is that you're you have the ability to do amazing things as a, you, your job you failed your job as a politician if a kid goes to bed hungry tonight mm -hmm. you know yeah. you have failed your your job and and you better make a, you better fix it tomorrow uh -huh. because that's your job right you know, and there's all this other stuff about getting the guy from West Virginia to vote for you because you're trying to get this and you're trying to get that. Or the other guy's like, we're not going to vote for him because if he looks good, that's going to screw him up. Meanwhile, some kid's going to bed tonight and he didn't get to eat. Right. Because right. you spend the day, you spend the day doing the worst things. Yeah. Okay. Now, there are the questions coming in. Are these from your... Yeah. So yeah. So I saw the one. Uh, is the art of true comedy dead? Not at all. It's yeah. it's it's always always there. That's the one thing that will always be there. The art of true comedy. Uh huh. The yeah, wealthy I, I, Hollywood I, actors should be out walking the streets of L.A. feeding the poor, not just the politicians. Yeah, of course. Yeah. But but the job of a politician is to, uh, you know, run their uh, communities. Yeah. And the job of a wealthy Hollywood actor, uh, although they should definitely be out there, you know, uh, helping the poor. And some of them do. And good for them. And yeah. uh, more people who have a lot of billions of dollars. But, you know, one of the things that people think is that every Hollywood actor is wealthy and most are not. Mm -hmm. and like in baseball, you know, it's a lot of people are making 40 million dollars and 23 yeah. million dollars and a lot of people are not making that money and right. you know it's only 600 of them playing baseball 
you know, yeah. so, uh, you know, but a lot of these baseball players will take their money and help the community. Yeah. Uh, a lot of and the funny, the, the, the funny thing is, is, uh, and I see this both in comedians and musicians, uh, as far as community minded and giving people, I think musicians and, and artists in general are the most giving and by golly, they take care of their own. They, if, if somebody is, uh, you know, when I was in South Bend, if somebody was short, they didn't have enough money to uh, get gas to go home or something like that. They took care of each other. And, yeah. you know, you know, Tom Dreesen, every freaking year, he, him and Tiffany Haddish are at the comedy store feeding, feeding the uh, um, homeless and doing a show for them. Yeah, and, it was at the, I think it was Laugh Factory that they were doing it. Is, is that, it is, yeah, it's, yeah, yeah. yeah it's, it's Laugh Factory. But that's, yeah. the, that's the way it is, you know. Um, my brother works in the film industry, and he's behind the camera doing the lights and stuff, and he spends every Thanksgiving feeding the poor and doing that. I work for mm -hmm. the uh, Roberto Clemente Foundation for, for the underprivileged kids of Puerto Rico, and also the Dominican kids with the Big Poppy Foundation, and I work with mm -hmm. juvenile diabetes and raise money for, you know, many, many causes. And, you know, comedians do that because we're, you know, we're, we have the ability to be able to do that. But a job of a politician is to represent the people and take care of their people. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we all should take care of the people. But, you know, a friend of mine once said something about politics. It's uh, we don't need a House of Representatives anymore. They needed a House of Representatives when there wasn't computers and ways for like somebody who lived in, you know, St. Louis and you had to send your person to Washington because otherwise you wouldn't hear what's going on. Yeah. But now if you can talk to the people in St. Louis, they don't have to come to, to D.C. You yeah. know, they don't have to have we don't need those representatives. We need, we need representatives to do the job of taking care of their constituency. Yeah. Yeah. Instead of representatives, we need project managers that can actually get shit done. Right. Or, <laughs> or, or great ec economic advisors who really are great. Yeah. And it's not about Democrat or Republican or any of that kind of stuff. Yeah. That ruins everything. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. yeah. If we wait for politicians to help the poor, they will all starve. Yeah. That's what's happening tonight. Tonight, there will be people who starve. Some will starve to death and their children. And, uh, yeah. you know, it's, and, and uh, they're not trying to get morose. I'm just saying it, it all relates to life and and uh, it all relates into, uh, you know, getting the deep truths out. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's what comedians do. And yeah. they and they do it in a in a way that you can laugh about it. And on the drive home, you're actually thinking about it and how you can be a better person. So that's you know it's uh, that you know that's the best that's the best things that comedians do is uh, is actually they can they can change minds and they can put you down a different path just by putting an idea forth and you laughing at it. So that's yeah. Great. So yeah. if you laughed, you have. You have, if you've made someone laugh, you've, you've done something incredible for that day. Yeah. Yeah. Even if you That's, make yourself laugh. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, Eddie, how can folks find you and see where you're going to be next? Okay. I have eddiebrill.com. I recently redid the website, but haven't, you know, the only, I haven't really kept up there with the dates, but you can always write me there, but I'm mm. on Twitter at Eddie underscore Brill. Okay. You know, Eddie underscore Brill on Twitter. I'm at uh, Eddie Comic at Instagram. And I'm on Facebook. I put a lot of my uh, stories that I've written about uh, about the industry. I've written them. On, they're on Facebook. I don't have a lot of room for um, new friends, but I do have a ton of other, uh, 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 you know, like you can go on there and follow me. And, there's, mm -hmm. you know, there's plenty of room for that to come up there. Someone said, nice chat. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas to you, too. Um, yeah, thank good. you. Thank you, Backyard Politics. I appreciate it. Yeah, it's very nice. Yeah, I, I, I didn't expect anybody to watch this. I didn't I didn't plug it or anything. So, yeah, that's okay. great. So, well, there, there's a few a people watching. People. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's great. The hearing what they have to say. Yeah, well, I tell you what, uh, you know, you were, you were super nice about me approaching you to do the podcast. You got back with me the same day, and I really appreciate it. Because Emo Phillips I, told me not to do this. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll tweet at him and say, "Yay, you know, Eddie did the show. Yeah, right. <laughs> but no, you know what it is, is that when when people ask me, I, I get asked a lot. And I uh -huh. understand 
that, you know, there's millions of podcasts. I have a few of them. I have three of them, actually. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, and there, I am proud of them. There's one called The Break with Eddie Brill. I did uh -huh. them a few years ago. It was 11 comics. It was, you know, Stephen Wright, Colin Quinn, Susie Essman, uh, Caroline Ray, you know, on and on and on. Jim Gaffigan. There's 11 of them. How they started. How uh -huh. they started as kids. Well, what was their house like as kids? Who was the funny people? It's called The Break with Eddie Bros. 11 of those. Okay. There's 25 video podcasts of me called OG Talk NYC. OG, the organic grill in New York City. We okay. interview Artie Lang and Colin Quinn and then the new mayor of New York, Eric Abrams, and, you know, and uh, Judy Gold and the CBS anchor person and uh, people from, you know, metal bands. And I mean, it's uh -huh. a nice mixture. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so there's, I have a few different things. So what I was saying was, it's very important that we keep each other, you know, relevant and we talk about comedy and we talk about stuff and whatever it is. So whenever someone writes to me, I try to write them right back so I don't get flooded with emails, you know, yeah. I forget who's who. And so that's why I wrote you right back. And I'm glad we pulled this off. Yeah, you're very gracious. I, re I really appreciate it. And uh, we learned a lot this hour. So I, I am... Uh, uh, going to listen to this one back and take notes because uh, there was some good stuff there. Yeah, get Stephen right on the show. He's a legend. Yeah, yeah I interviewed him. I went to college with Stephen. We're still uh -huh. great friends. And uh, he's amazing. And I did put, three... Put a, word, put a word in for me, bud. All right, I will. <laughs> Stephen's an amazing human being. <laughs> he, he really is. And, and one of my favorite interviews with him is Bob Zaney did a podcast for a while. And I remember. they were... They were sitting in a restaurant, I think, and, and Zan, uh, yeah, like, and Zan, Zan was Zan was with them, and uh, it was just just such an outrageous conversation. It's so funny, and I know that um, Stephen was he just thought Zan was the prettiest woman he'd seen in in forever. So th that was going on, but that that was just such a funny. Yeah, interview. I was with uh, them earlier in the day, and they were oh heading. okay. I was, they were heading out. Uh, they just came back and they said, oh, we just interviewed Steve. And I went, oh, great. Because, you know, so it was like it was a group of all good friends together. And, yeah, you know, it's pretty good. I still, you know, I don't uh, I speak to Zan still. I speak to Stephen. Bob, I haven't spoken to a while, but his amazing wife, uh, Aaron, and I are friends uh -huh. for a million years. And so we all know each other. We all look yeah. out for each other. Yeah, you got to. I, I learned really quick. I got to be nice to everybody because uh, everybody <laughs> knows everybody. <laughs> it's very true. <laughs> well, Eddie, thanks so much for being on the show. This was really, really good. And uh, I just wish you the best. I, I you're, you're a really kind soul. And uh, I, I, I we, we need more of you. So it's well, great to have you. I appreciate that very, very much. It was very kind of you to say. I had a good time. Happy holiday. Bucky Goldstein. <laughs> Fantastic joke, Mr. Backward poli Backyard yep. <laughs> Politics. Yeah. Yeah. I'm looking for a Jewish cowboy. Yeah. Oh. So, what's your name? I'm Bucky Goldstein. He's amazing. But thank you. It was so nice to meet you. Yeah. And uh, we'll talk again soon. Okay. Thank you. Well. Thanks a lot, Eddie.